Welcome to the Armani Talks podcast. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this podcast, I'm helping you level up your communication skills. Every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you will learn more about public speaking, social skills, creative writing, and plenty of other topics regarding soft skills. So hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification, and stay updated. Today, we are back for Unapologetic Truths Part 4 with Harsh Strongman, Life Math Money. Welcome back. Hey, Arman. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Can you believe that we're already on number four? It's like we have this little saga going on. Time fast. Time passes fast, brother. We are more than halfway through the year already, and it was a breeze. Yes. I want to go back and talk about one of our first interactions together, where I believe this is going to open up a big lesson for you don't know until you ask. So I believe one of our first interactions happened when we were both starting our Twitter accounts at the same time. You started on May 2018, right? Hmm. I started June 2018. So from the very beginning, we started around the same time. And I think initially, you invited me to do a guest blog on your website, which was how to become a better storyteller. And then after the guest blog, I was just like, you know, I'm starting a podcast. It'll be pretty funny if uh, Harsh Strongman, Life Math Money can actually come through. But initially when I asked you, I thought you were just going to say a flat out no. And in the initial stages, I think you were, you said yes down the line. But I thought that was just a polite way of saying no. But as a few months went on by, we actually coordinated it and it happened. So I thought that was a good lesson in you just don't know until you ask. Absolutely. I think people tend to think that everyone is extremely busy or just will say no. And sometimes that is the case. But you lose nothing by asking. And in some cases, just by asking, you sort of let the person whom you ask the question to know that you exist. So in the future, they you will be a familiar face to them rather than someone who's completely new. So even if you get a no, just the fact that you asked is a bit of an introduction. So there is nothing to lose and everything to gain. Exactly. Did you ever have that moment where you asked and they just flat out said no and you were embarrassed or you don't really get embarrassed like that? I don't think I've ever gotten embarrassed and there's probably been many times where I asked something and got no, but to be honest, I can't really remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things though, you don't really remember all the rejection. If you keep asking for a lot of things, like if you make it a habit to try to get what you want, you have so many rejections that... You stop remembering them and it stops hurting. Like you you really don't care. Like it's just, you haven't lost anything and it's just, just another day. Yes. It's basically abundance mindset where I wrote a blog post a couple of months back where I wrote it about how to overcome rejection fast. And I said, it really comes down to thinking about opportunities as grapes. If you're eating a bunch of grapes and one of the grapes falls, Are you just going to be sweating about that and being like, oh no, what am I going to do? This one grape fell. You'll probably be thinking that if you haven't eaten in a long time and you don't have any other grapes, but if you have a whole bunch of other grapes with you, then just dropping one, it is what it is. So I think it's the same thing with opportunities where if you're in motion, you're creating some different items for yourself, then Getting a rejection every now and then is like a dropped grape. I would have to agree, although I would like to add that it is something that you need practice to just become comfortable with. For example, if you start getting into sales, let's say that you pitch your first customer and they say no. It's going to hurt a little bit, but as you keep going, you will get some wins, a lot of failures, and it would just become a way of life and it would stop impacting your emotions. And that's the case with rejection 
across anything the more practice you get that is the more more you are used to taking chances the more chances you take the bolder you are you learn to accept the fact that you cannot win every single shot you take and mm-hmm. the act of taking this shot is still worth it you have to see the failure as a win that you have gotten more experience you have taken a shot you have basically go- gotten ahead to give a trivial example that is let's say that there's a cute girl on the street and you go and say hi and you, you know, try to get her number even mm-hmm. if you get a flat out no you've still gotten more experience like you have still gone out of your comfort zone done something new and maybe the next time you do it you have learned something and you will be better and you will you might succeed the next time so you have to see it as a win right it's funny that you brought up that example because around high school for me which was almost a decade ago uh, there was this popular show that came out that started to resonate with a lot of young men it was called the pickup artist and this is where uh, the there's a guy named mystery he talks about different frameworks on how to pick up women by that guy i haven't read it yet i just bought it because someone recommended it to me is is it the one with neil strauss um i'm not sure but it's i think it's a book about game i think uh yeah so that's the one i don't know the full so, story of this guy though i remember reading about him in the rational mail and apparently he got well he fell for some girl and basically became a total weird beta male yeah so i didn't actually ever read that book i, I heard about it a lot because i believe it was that mystery guy who was bringing it up in the show the pickup artist but basically the concept of the show is where you get a bunch of geeky men and you surround them with three casanovas the people that can pick up women very quickly one of them was mystery and the other two i forgot their names and basically for the next couple of weeks uh, these pickup artists teach these dorks how to start picking up uh, girls and when i'm telling you these guys are dorks they are flat out losers uh, they play they just stay at home all the time uh, they don't really interact with many people so this is going to be a challenge this is the whole concept of the show and it's basically a competition for the next couple of weeks to see who from these geeks turns into a pickup artist and over time it's basically what you just recommended just to keep practicing and practicing and practicing so they're basically being put in these different situations where they have to exercise their social skills uh, they're going to clubs they're going to uh, approach random strangers on the street and over time you'll see two of the people who have such drastic transformations and you're just seeing their personality change in the show so over time I, it was funny because during high school uh, this show s- sparked l- a little cultural movement a lot of the guys are like i want to do that as well i don't know if that was ever happening where you're from but this was a oh, very popular show a decade ago that definitely not happen where i'm from but i would <laughs> i would say this from what you have told me is that this is well in some cases it makes sense but i i'll draw an analogy okay let's say that you have a product and you have two aspects to it one is the quality of the product and the other is the marketing and what you are talking about some guy who plays video games all day and now he's just exposing himself to social situations see he's improving his marketing and that is going to give him some success like terrible products with good marketing do get sales but over the long run you are better off improving the product itself in this case this geeky guy needs to get rid of his video games go to the gym fix his body fix his finances fix his social skills and also fix his marketing like he shouldn't just focus on the social skills aspects because that's just a very superficial thing he needs to get the foundation ready and the whole 
marketing aspect then becomes really easy it's very easy to learn social skills if you're a hot rich guy like people will be far more forgiving of your mistakes so you're basically saying do both at the same time where you should increase your value and then it becomes much easier to share value to others i think the first priority should be increasing your value simply because it makes learning social skills and improving your presentation much easier it makes people more receptive to give you an example let's say this really fat obese guy okay but he's a very friendly smooth and interesting person how many people would still entertain him even for a first meeting a lot of people will not like people will just write him off on the spot because they will assume this guy must be a crap head he doesn't he's fat and complete people will just make assumptions and not even want to give him a chance so this guy is better off fixing his foundation first this opens many doors and then fixing your social skills is a very trivial thing you can do it in 2 3 4 months by going out every single day and trying to talk to more and more people read the book how to win friends and influence people fixing your social skills is not that difficult but building a foundation takes some time and i would recommend at least start working on your foundation before you go out and start basically trying to meet more people because almost all the people you meet will probably reject you if you give off the vibe that the foundation is not there yet like if you have that have you seen that nerdy look some nerdy people have where they look like this guy has not gotten off his computer in or in an entire year and he hasn't even trimmed his beard properly yeah <laughs> and no matter how cool this guy's life might be if he goes out and actually tries to talk to people people will just make the assumption this guy is a boring nerd and will not even give him a chance especially women women will women won't even give him a second look in most cases so he's he's better off like going to the gym first yes so in my book charisma king i talk about how self improvement and social skills go hand in hand where nowadays a lot of individuals want to compare things is it what you say or how you say it and my philosophy is that you need a little bit of both and just to give you an example imagine harsh i come up to you and i'm giving you a hamburger but the hamburger doesn't have a wrapping around it it's just my palm holding onto the burger and me being like here you go harsh eat this you'll be like man i don't want to eat that this is weird where's the wrapper you should have put it in a nice little wrapper before you presented it to me so in a different situation i give you the burger and this time it's a wrapper on it a very polished one at that and you'll be like all right yeah i'll eat this i know you're on a diet by the way so just uh, for the sake of example in this situation it's where the product in itself without any form of marketing may turn certain people off but let's say i just give the person the wrapper with no burger inside or the burger inside is moldy once again all these variables play a big role so for us to get the final product for it to work perfectly we should have a great burger we should polish it up correctly with a nice wrapper and then we deliver it so it's not only what versus how is what and how how can we create that synergy and that's pretty much what the book charisma king is trying to bring home to the person where you shouldn't ever just rely on social skills and separate it from self improvement you should be combining it with one another you should be taking your fashion fitness your self education very seriously and that by itself makes you a much more interesting person that can connect with others with more ease makes complete sense so how do you think somebody let's say is a complete and total nerd like the guy in the show you mentioned what would be a good starting point for him in your opinion so the first one i would highly recommend is build something it could either be 
business or body, I recommend starting off with a body just because it automatically gets you feeling a different way. And once you start understanding how to build a stronger body, be more flexible, increase strength, that's when another variable just falls out of it, which is fashion. I came to find out that a lot of guys don't take their clothes seriously at all. They're like, man, it's completely feminine. I'm not saying that you got to be a model or anything, but at least wear clothes that fit. And if you have a great body, automatically, you could pretty much wear anything with high quality and it's better. Clothes can influence perception very well. So by focusing on the body, we just had another variable fall out of it. And from there, I recommend building some sort of business or side hustle. Because I think it's very difficult to have a lot of confidence in yourself, especially as a man, if you don't create anything and you just consume all day. So those would be my three different ways to become much more interesting. And then when you're interacting with other people, you come from that higher value rather than asking them, oh man, how can I get them to like me? You're starting to wonder, do I like them? So those would be how I start. What about you? Agreed. I had a very similar journey. So I started going to the gym when I was 16. And before that, I used to be a bit of a nerd. And not in a negative sense, but I would, I was very interested in technology and software and things like that. And I would spend most of my time on my computer. I didn't really care about other people's perception. So I wasn't, how do I put it? I wasn't socially, I wasn't too inept. But I just wasn't interested in people at all. And I would rather just play video games and relax and watch some TV. So it happened by accident that I started going to the gym. And that day kind of changed my life because I remember when I joined the gym, the gym trainer asked me to do some push-ups. And I could not do a single push-up. And really? Yeah, I could not do a single push-up at 16. And I think I, I weighed like 70 kg. I was like a very skinny kid at 70 kg. And I couldn't do a single pull-up. And it, it was a shocker because I used to think at that point that I'm healthy. And when you think you're healthy and you can't do a push-up, you realize how healthy you actually are. Mm -hmm. So over time, and it wasn't like a one day and then everything was different, but over the next two years, so when I was 16, I think I was just out of 10th grade. I was in like 11th grade when I started going to the gym. So over the next two years, 11th and 12th grade, I would focus more and more on the gym and I would actually see a lot of changes in my body. What would happen is that I would spend two, three hours in the gym and I would not work out for two, three hours. I would like spend... I would work out very slowly, talk to everybody there, basically be a teenager. And, but I was still making some gains and my body was changing quite a bit. And I remember that every time I would meet someone after a few months, people would give me a lot of compliments. People would be like, you look completely different. You stand up straighter now, you're taller and you are more muscular and you no longer look like a small wind can blow you away. <laughs> and that I found that to be very motivating and that led me into other things as well for example once your body starts getting better women are going to notice you more you will have more confidence to do what you want to, the more compliments you get generally the more confidence you will have and the more your self esteem will be especially around that age so at that point I just it was just a big change in my life and that allowed me to pursue other things as well. So I got into business later, which also has been very successful and good for me. And it's just been getting to the gym, fixing my body has created a lot of momentum that led me into other things. So I would have to agree with what you say. The first place to start is your body. It fixes a lot of things for you. And when you were out of shape, Harsh, were you the very fat out of shape or were you overly skinny 
I have been both. I have been both very fat and I have been very skinny. So when I was, really? when I was until eighth or seventh grade, I used to be chubby. And the reasoning, at least what my mother says is, so when I was in second grade, I got something called jaundice. So it's a very annoying disease where everything becomes yellow. And it got really, really bad for me. And somehow it healed properly, thankfully. But the doctors on that point basically told me and my mother that your body's going to basically balloon up over the next few years. And that tends to happen to everyone who gets jaundice. Really? Which really did happen. I, I really did balloon up. But after ninth, eighth or ninth grade, you start getting taller so fast that all of the calories that you have around your body get consumed. So at that point, I became very skinny, which is a little interesting because I was 70 kg and 70 kg is not what you would expect a 15 or 14 year old to be skinny at, but I was still quite skinny. And 70 kg, I'm just translating that into pounds because uh, just for 155 pounds and you're not a short guy either. You're a pretty tall guy. So you must have been really skinny then. Well, I was quite skinny. Yeah. So for me, I, so here's my story. So for for reference, I weigh 225 now. That's crazy. Thanks. So you gained a lot of weight since then. Well, yeah, I've done quite a bit of cut and bulk cycles, and it took me a while to gain some mass. Although I'm going to cut now, maybe I'll cut six, seven kgs and then bulk again. And that's another process of the whole weightlifting thing, where in the beginning stages, you're just thinking it's a go to the gym, lift weights. But later on, as you progress on the journey, nutrition is just a big factor as well. And then there's sleep. And then there's how you eat, when you eat. Everyone's body type is different. So it takes you in a different journey other than just going to the gym and ending it right there. It's more so a lifestyle change. Agreed. Although I, I don't think newbies should worry about that. I think they just need to get in the gym and do a workout, come home and do that regularly. I wasn't even that regular when I started because I was 16 and I would rather spend time with my friends and, you know, watch TV. So I would just go maybe three, four times a week. But it did, it really does make a lot of difference and you will grow very fast in your first year. Mm-hmm. And it just teaches you about discipline as well. So you basically got your wake up call when you couldn't do a push up when you were 16. Yes, it it was physical or should I say real world confirmation that what I thought of myself and what I actually was did not tally up. I came to realize that a lot of people that go to the gym, they have a lot more just accountability in general because they're not expecting someone to save them if they can't lift this much amount of weight. They understand that yo, it's because of me that I can't lift this weight. Now I got to do something about it. And I think this is the perfect mindset when you're starting to run a business where you start to act like the CEO and you're like, man, this isn't going to happen unless I'm showing up. This podcast isn't going to get recorded if Armani and Harsh aren't both showing up. Where there's accountability that's being factored in. See, the thing with things I go to the gym is that the main variable is yourself and you can't really blame anybody else. So you can't say that I can't do X, Y, Z. I can't lift this much weight or I am fat because of racism or whatever other reason, because of some political party or because of some president or or whatever other reason that you what you like to give for your other failures. So you will rarely find complainers, feminists, political people in places like sports where it is really about merit. If you are good at something, you're good at something. And if you're bad, you're bad. And you can't really blame anybody else for it. Yes, that's right, dude. 
<laughs> you have me dying laughing whenever, let's say one of your tweets goes viral and say certain people are being like, yo, man, this isn't right. This isn't right. You'll get that. You'll get their profile picture and you'll make fun of their chin. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't try to shame people like this, but if you're going to attack me on Twitter, prepare to be attacked back, okay? Because this is not the place where we just take it. No? If you are going to start calling me a misogynist, racist, sexist, you have to be prepared to hear an answer. You can't go and attack people and then expect them to do nothing about it. But that's... Dude, it's too funny. <laughs> but that, that really goes to show the point that when people don't have their own physicality under control, they have all these opinions that don't hold up in reality. Like if this some guy can't even manage his own weight, why would anyone listen to his opinions about anything? Like you don't even know what to eat. Yeah, I mean, one of the skill sets nowadays is learning how not to have an opinion. Where if you always have an opinion on any new thing that other people are talking about, what you're doing is you're overloading your information system because people are just walking information systems. And when you're over here having an opinion on this matter, this matter, this matter, now where is your attention going on for investing back in yourself? Mm. Probably not much. So it's funny because when you're basically making fun of the chin, I actually see it as a symbol for you bringing awareness to other facets of their life which I'm sure you weren't even thinking about. I'm pretty sure you're just thinking, and let me clown this dude real quick. But it is a symbol at the end of the day. Well, it's more of a humiliation tactic, so to speak, from my end. <laughs> <laughs> because, you see, th these people have no self-awareness in the sense that there, there, there are guys online who have ex like, chins that are so loose that that basically means that they have no muscle, like they, they have a lot of fat. And they have no muscle. But somehow they will start attacking you for whatever you say. Like, like, how about you fix your life first, brother, and then start telling me what I can and can't say. And there's also another aspect to it where it just goes to show that people on our side, people who think like us, are fit, healthy, rich people. And people who think like them are fatsos with loose chins. There's a good mm -hmm. subliminal messaging there that I'm trying to promote. Yeah, dude, because our side of Twitter, I mean, I don't like to normally just call it self-improvement Twitter. I like to call it just improvement Twitter. Right. It's very Twitter. small. Yeah, it's very small where I try to view Twitter as a universe. And I consider us a very small planet where within our planet, there's guys that talk about uh, fitness my page talks about communication skills. Your page talks about uh, accounting, finances, uh, health. Uh, certain pages talk about relationships. But it's a very small part of Twitter. Where for me personally, I have the Armani Talks Twitter page where I strictly use it to create. And then I have just a personal page where I you know, interact with my college buddies, some co old school coworkers. And when I scroll through that feed, it's just weird a lot of the tweets that go viral it's just about people complaining whining uh, basically bringing uh, uh, their flaws into light and those are the tweets that are stacking up 50,000 likes 100,000 retweets and it just makes me realize just having two twitter accounts how small self improvement twitter rising twitter whatever you call it really is I would say self-improvement Twitter has at best f maybe 1 million people at best. And that is compared to a Twitter's monthly active user base of 350 million people. So it's like 0.3%. Mm -hmm. Do you see that changing down the future? Do you see rising Twitter taking up more? Or do you think this is just how reality is? People are attracted to the negative. I do see it growing, but I don't see it becoming hmm, the mainstream way of thought. Well, it, it will become mainstream among certain circles, but I think entertainment and 
whatever wastes time, what is based on emotion will always be more popular because 80% of people on the planet lack the sensitivity or the DNA to basically care about self-improvement and to have any ambition. And your Twitter at this point, I, I would actually say is the biggest in rising Twitter. So you're bringing awareness to this. And I have a funny story. Last year, my neighbor, uh, he's an Indian uh, fellow and his roommate is Australian. And I remember I was walking down one of these days and they had just gotten into Twitter and they were like, yo, Armani, what are your other interests? And I told them about some other interests that I have. And they were like, yo, man, you should follow this account called Life Math Money on Twitter. And it was just so funny to me because (laughs) this is a person in Tampa, Florida, and he's being aware of your account. I was like, man, this guy has no clue that, you know, me and Life Math Money actually have a, uh, you know, conversations and that sort of stuff where for this person, he's like, yo, man, I'm putting you on some game. Check out Life Math Money. <laughs> well, I hope that guy is listening to this. Yeah, we're like, wait, Armani, himself. <laughs> you, <laughs> you knew him? <laughs> I think he ended up buying one of your products as well. Oh, is it? Well, thank you, brother, if you're listening. See, it's always good up- when people support you. The the main motive for Life Math Money is to basically consolidate all the lessons that I learned in my life and put it out there for younger people to read and learn from so that they can grow faster. Because I ha- I happen to be in a very unique position to learn because I'm a young entrepreneur and I'm also fit and I have a lot of interests and I read a lot. So I tend to get a lot of knowledge from different places. And I... I'm basically creating a repository of the most important, most valuable pieces of knowledge that I have found in my own personal life and experience. And I'm putting it up on Life Math Money for everybody. So instead of you having to spend 20 years to learn it, you can get it right away. See, would you, to give an example, would you rather marry the wrong woman and get divorced? Or would you rather read the Life Math Money article on how to pick a woman correctly? So the chances of you getting divorced are minimal. Like this is something that you don't want to learn the hard way. Right. Is that a new article you wrote or one I of your older articles? On oh, so we got a preview going on. <laughs> Do you have one of the tips that you want to include in this episode or it's still being created? Well, it's still being created, but I will tell you one of the tips and You should not marry a woman who has a bad relationship with her father because Mm. a woman's father is what sets the tone for all the masculine relationships she has in her life. So if she respects her father and understands why he's protective, she is far more likely to respect you and understand you than some woman who hates her father and thinks he was a patriarch who was harassing her because then that's the image she will cast upon you and she will always view you with some suspicion. And she carries a lot of emotional baggage. To hate your own father is a lot of baggage and it also seems to be not so uncommon. So that first relationship with the father plants the relationships that she's going to have with other men. Yes. See, it's a lot like This is the lens she's going to view masculinity with. This was her introduction to men when she was very young. And if it's a very crappy one, if she hates a father, that crappy projection will apply to you. I'll give you a Ben Franklin quote. And it's it's a very good quote and has a lot of deep wisdom in it. It goes something like, a bad daughter will make an uncontro- uh, a bad daughter will make an unmanageable wife 
let me let me look it up to see the exact wording because it had a lot more power and it just gave me a minute i don't want to ruin it sure was this from his autobiography this one is from his book uh, his almanac poor richard's almanac you know poor some almanac yeah poor richard's almanac wait let me see sure i mean benjamin franklin was a polymath so each of the insights that he bought i mean he must have put a lot of thought behind it an undutiful daughter will prove an unmanageable wife so it starts with her as a daughter so if how is her relationship with her father and if it's bad it's going to be bad with you as well well you guys heard it here folks this is going to be uh, this is going to be a very interesting blog post once you're done with it send it over and i'll link it in the description box awesome uh, well, i will do so so what is your take on this what do you think is a great woman to marry and what should men avoid well i 100% agree with the the father relationship that you just gave and what i found very peculiar is that i was reading the comments of this one video a couple of weeks back and it's basically where this one girl had a great relationship with her father growing up but within the past couple of years with like a bunch of the talk regarding the patriarchy this patriarchy that something within her her mind got polluted and she started to view her dad in a completely different lens and she started to you know be very disrespectful towards him and was like man you were a patriarch uh, my entire childhood now that i think about it uh, you never let mom do this and that you never let me do this and that and for a couple of months she apparently had this very resentful uh, attitude towards her father and those months turned into years and the reason that she was posting the comment was because the video that she was posting a comment on was basically a video of a guy that was saying you are being brainwashed hey, all this propaganda regarding patriarchy this patriarchy that is ruining you and so when she wrote that comment she was like listen i fell victim to this where i used to love my father then i became jaded towards him and during his last couple of years of living i was able to luckily salvage that relationship again so that's a big point that needs to be made where even if you do have great memories with someone and you get new knowledge and you feed it to this person it can completely distort those memories and make you think of it in a different way so uh, to add to answer your question i think yes the relationship with the father is important but another factor that i factor in is what kind of knowledge is she consuming because if she's consistently consuming garbage then i'm pretty sure she's going to switch up on me in just a matter of time if she is someone who seems like a good person but she's always reading a whole bunch of this propaganda a sensationalist news i am never taking a girl like that seriously because this is a person whose mind can be controlled and if her mind can be controlled then easily her behavior can be controlled does that make sense definitely i would have to completely agree here basically if she's consuming feminist harpy and you know modernist crap this is like good food on a bad plate it's going to get bad eventually it's just a matter of time so you better off not eating it yeah dude because i mean that comment i, I don't think people whoever's listening to this understand how deep that comment was because it ended up being pinned by the initial guy because he's or basically she's showing that her past got altered strictly due to new information and then she had to basically unlearn a whole bunch of this stuff so it's important what people are consuming and to take it even a little further harsh who is she hanging out with is she consistently hanging out with losers if that's the case i don't know if i want to be with her because basically who you hang out with is eventually going to play a big role in just how you think how you act so to answer your question i would say the kind of knowledge she's consuming and the kind of people she's hanging out with i would have to agree that as well although i will say that 
women in relationships tend to listen to you if you are male so if you disapprove of a friend she is very likely to give them up i should write a blog post on this too <laughs> <laughs> well not all women and spoiled women will not do that but if it's a good woman and she's only starting to go bad then you can save her like a woman right. that has already gone bad can't be saved but if she's only starting to hang around in these circles then there's still time and i'll give you an example okay so here in india this is married woman and her mother in law and they were out basically like it was like a meeting of family friends and everybody and we had this one woman in our group uh the family circle make a comment about that basically said that your in-laws like for a woman her in-laws are basically an annoyance and she should try to get rid of them as soon as possible and this woman's mother-in-law scream like she tells her daughter-in-law immediately right then and there you never be friends with this woman and bo- she both of them just left and mm. she basically saved this daughter-in-law's life by preventing her from getting this whole crappy ideology in her head by hanging around this other woman wow this has happened with someone you know or yeah this happened it's yes. a story it happened yeah man and the same thing with guys i mean for because a lot of women listen to this podcast as well if you're trying to choose a guy you got to also be very aware a guy that's not ambitious for example is going to always go backwards there's no such thing as maintenance you see there you're going up or down once you look at the bigger picture so if the guy is over here and not doing much work you have to convince him yo do this then for the ladies listening to this that's a sign of a loser where you have to spark this guy's ambition on his own see he should be sparking it on himself is that women already know that women don't need to be taught how to pick men they seem to have a very intuitive understanding of it since childhood like they they tend to know these things already it is men who need to be taught because men tend to be romantic and stupid but women are always smart in these matters in fact this might be the only topic where women are purely logical and men are purely emotional wow never heard that before now that i think about it why do you think that is do you well, think it's for survival reasons yes i think it's evolutionary and have you ever heard a man say that i would not be interested in sara because sara lacks the income potential that i'm looking for the what potential the income potential the earning potential No, I never heard that before. But you will often hear women say things like that, like this man doesn't make enough money so I can't be with him. Whereas it's not a consideration for men at all. Women are very logical about whom they choose to fall in love with. And once they fall in love, then it's a different thing, but whom they let themselves fall for, they are very opportunistic about it. They are very logical. So if um let if you take an incel Why is an incel unattractive to a woman? Because he's a loser. Like she already knows that he's going nowhere in life, so I should not go with him. But women who are complete losers, just like women who would be exactly like that incel, total losers, will still be able to find men because men don't think that way. They're stupider in these matters. And you think it's because evolutionary <laughs> this is something that was programmed i think women have definitely had this programming because historically a woman's entire life depend on this choice so if she picked a great guy her life would be great she would have a lot of comforts she would have access to a lot of resources and her children would be healthier assuming the male was fitter and if she picked a crappy guy then she's screwed so 
women have a very strong evolutionary knowledge in their DNA that tells them which men to go for. And you will always notice that women always pick a guy better than them. Like if a guy makes a hundred K and she will only make it her thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars because she will only go for a guy who is better than her. I wrote a tweet a couple of weeks back where I said that men are very direct. So whenever you're communicating with them, factor in words above anything else. And women communicate in a very indirect way. So when you're communicating with them, be very aware of body language. And I came to realize that women are very capable of picking up social cues in a subconscious sort of way, where I'll give you an example. Last year, I was working with this couple where for a while I would work with the guy, the husband, and then right afterwards, I would work with uh, the wife. Uh, One was starting to launch a TikTok account and he wanted some help on presenting his ideas. And the wife was launching an Instagram account where she's a chef. I forgot what happened one day, but I was feeling extremely sick, but I didn't want to cancel the appointments. So I had the appointment with the guy first and, you know, we're talking, he's hearing the words, everything is going well. And then afterwards, right after, by the way, I had the meeting with the wife. And as soon as I'm speaking, the first 10 seconds, she's like, Armani, what's wrong? I was like, what do you mean what's wrong? It's like, Something about your facial expressions just seem different today. Uh, are you feeling okay? And I was like, what the heck? How does she notice that? It's, it's, I was using the same words and everything, but it was just second nature that she noticed something like that. So I just found it very strange. Like Since starting Armani Talks, how I talk about communication skills, I see how differently guys and girls communicate. There's a very good book on this. It's called The Female Brain. And the author's name is Lolan B. Something. I I don't remember her name. And the book says that women have historically been the dependent sex. That is, they have always depended on men for survival. And they have also been the sex that is responsible for caring for children. So historically, women have evolved to understand body language and social signals much better because it helps them gain power and control and it also helps them take care of babies so for example if she notices her man is angry and she's able to behave in a way that calms him down her life would be much better than if she did not notice it and if she notices when her man is happy and she behaves in a way that gets him to give her gifts her life would be better if the, if she her life would be better than if she was not noticing these things so they have evolved to pay a lot of attention to social cues emotions and even unconscious ones so if if you take a woman she has to take care of a child so she has to be able to read the child's emotions and its tiny facial expressions to know if the child is feeling okay bad if it's hungry if it wants to take a shit or whatever other things. So this is something women have evolved over thousands of years for. Like they have a far better understanding of social cues than the average male. But that is not to say that women are aware of it. This is one of those unconscious things that women are good at. But they are, they don't have technical understanding of it in the sense that they, they have a natural talent, but they are using it so innately that they have no understanding of how they are doing it. It's someone that's naturally very, very good at something, and they don't understand how gifted that is because it's always been natural for them. Yes, but... It also opens them up to a lot of manipulation. And this is why women are very easily manipulated, especially by all these social media patriarchy and propaganda shit. It plays into the fact that women, since they are so emotional, like they understand emotions so well, they're also 
more in tune with their own emotions. And when you change these emotions in her, her whole perception of reality changes. So in, in the example you gave earlier, there was this woman who was in, on good terms with her father, but someone didn't change the emotions associated with all of her memories. And it went from happy memories to memories of somehow being oppressed by her father because of patriarchy or whatever. And that essentially changed her reality, which is something that would not happen in men, but it would happen in women all the time. Yes, I ended up also writing a tweet that went pretty viral. And normally when a viral tweet happens, people attack you for it. You know, there's always that sector of people that disagree with it. But this was a tweet that most people just agreed with. I said that men measure maturity by the ability to control emotions. Women measure maturity as the ability to express emotions. Mm. So if we're seeing a guy over here, uh, you know, throwing a hissy fit, uh, getting mad, uh, easily manipulated, just as men, we're going to lose a lot of respect for this person. So, you know, if, that's why when a guy is just like getting brainwashed left and right, this isn't a guy that's capable of being taken seriously by his peers, especially in the uh, male sex. While with women, they view the ability to express emotions in a very uh, high level where I believe, you know, if you're trying to be a good person and a well-rounded person as a whole, you should be able to do a little bit of both. You should be able to control your emotions. And in certain scenarios, you should be able to express your emotions accordingly. In a negotiation, for example, if you feel like you're being given the short end of the stick, you don't want to just be shifting your body around uh, trying to show that you're agitated. You want to be able to articulate those feelings in a way where you're not rubbing the other guy the wrong way and not creating an enemy for no reason. So I believe it's a little bit of doing both. What do you think? Do you think maturity should be measured by controlling emotions, expressing emotions, or a little bit of both? I would say knowing how to express emotions is a part of being able to control them. Because only if you can control something, you can express it clearly. Like a guy having a hissy fit is essentially incapable of expressing his dissatisfaction in a more reasonable way. So I think that it's really the same thing. With women, women don't... So women have this ideal for men that men should have control over their emotions and men should, you know, be masculine. But they don't hold this ideal on themselves. That is, they they don't care that whether they are rational or not. They can just do whatever they want and which is fair, you know, they're women. But I'm not sure what you mean by women prize themselves or women think highly of being able to express emotions. So let me just be clear real quick. When I say that men are valuing controlling emotions and women are valuing expressing emotions, I'm talking about respective to their own sex. So I'm not saying that men want women to control their emotions in terms of a subconscious state and women want men to express their emotions in a subconscious state. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. So a couple of months back, there was this tweet that ended up going very viral. And I thought it was a comical tweet, but showed a lot about psychology. Basically, there was a woman who was saying, you know, I really hate it whenever I'm sharing my problems to my husband and he's over here trying to solve the problem ASAP. Like, can you just let me vent? And people were laughing nonstop in the tweet while a lot of guys were like what's wrong and the women were like i hate when men do that and this just showed how different that men and women view the problems where for the men on instinct they just want to solve the problem immediately but for the woman she just wants to use this as an opportunity to express her emotions so a lot of the times when women are bringing up problems they don't actually want you to solve it. They just want you to let them vent and express themselves. So that's pretty much, yeah. So that's what I I was pretty much meaning where this is the type of standard and type of communication tactics 
that they have with their own sex. What are your thoughts on that? The book I mentioned earlier, uh, The Female Brain, it had a pretty good explanation to why women are like this. And I used to be pretty perplexed about this as well. Like, you know, if she has a problem and I'm solving it, why is she getting annoyed by this, getting a solution? And I, I would think that women are very vain in the sense that she just wants to talk about her problem just to feel heard. So in the book, The Female Brain, I learned that, well, see, there's a portion of the brain called the amygdala, and that is a portion of the brain that is used to process emotions. And the way things work is that when you have input, they first go to the amygdala, and then they go to the prefrontal cortex where they are processed for solutions. The prefrontal cortex is the execution portion of your brain. Like It helps you think and make decisions. So what happens for men is that the wiring between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex is in such a way that data moves very fast from the emotional part of the brain to the logical part of the brain. So men don't tend to be as emotional and they just want to solve the problem. On the other hand, with women, the wiring is such that things tend to stay in the amygdala a little bit longer and then go to the prefrontal cortex. So things are more emotional for her for a longer time. And only then she wants to get into how she can actually solve her problem. So that is the only, so so to speak, uh, biological explanation that I've seen for this phenomenon anywhere. And it's a pretty good book. I would recommend buying it. It's a book by a female, uh, The Female Brain. The Female Brain. I'll be sure to include it in the description box. Let me find the author's name because there's probably more books like this. Just a second. She also wrote a book called The Male Brain, but that book is not as good as this one. It's good to be able to notice a lot of these concepts, not only on a psychology realm, but also explaining it with biology as well. So the name of the author is... Luan Brizendin, MD. Okay, I'll include that in the description box. Yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. So I think a lot of the personality things that men and women have differently are simply because of different biologies that have become divergent because of a long period of evolution and basically differences in how men and women are in the sense that if since women are physically weaker, they it wouldn't be ideal in a society to send them to the military because they are weaker and they would die. And men are physically stronger, so it would be ideal to send them for war. And if your purpose has been to fight and die for a long, long, long time, you would be wired to not linger on emotions because if you start lingering on emotions in an important situation like a war or some kind of fight with some animal you will die but when you're protected from things like these you have more luxury especially when your role in society has been to care for men depend on men and care for children then you would on the other hand be biologically incentivized to develop the parts of the brain that help you understand, process emotions and social cues. Mm. To give you an, an analogy, there have been some studies that show that gay men tend to have brain structures similar to women's. And they tend to respond to hormones that make... So the, as men, we emit some hormones that essentially turn women on and these gay men will get turned on by those hormones as well and it kind of I, i'm not i'm not conf this is not a confirmed theory or anything but i think that is why gay people are known for having good taste in fashion and because women have good taste in fashion right interesting that's actually something that 
and now that you bring it up, I do notice uh, a lot of the gay men that I know are always on point with their outfits. And they'll let you know when you're not on point, but they'll deliver it in a way where it sounds like they're joking, but they're giving you a proper constructive criticism as well. It's a very interesting topic to get into the whole biology aspect of why we are the way we are. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to link that book, Female Brain, in the description box. It, it is extremely important because nowadays, with a lot of these social norms that are emerging, it's very easy to just get away from a lot of the elements that are core to us, where we can mask it for a while, but there are certain differences between both genders. And if we're trying to just make everything the same, then it may work in the beginning stages. But over time, I mean, the mask is going to fall off and certain things which are at the root, you cannot change. So I say that you learn social norms through just reading a bunch of stuff, but you learn human nature through pain. So certain things are just nature. I mean, you can't change it. You got to learn how to work with it. Agreed. I think a big problem nowadays is that our lives are too comfortable in the sense that we we have no reason to go after truth and improve. To draw an analogy, let's say that women are gold and men are iron. And that is a very good analogy because gold is inherently valuable, but iron has to become valuable like by becoming a sword or whatever. Okay, so that's how things are, right? An 18-year-old girl is like the most valuable thing in the world, but an 18-year-old guy is a scrap. Like, no one cares about an 18-year-old guy. He has, he doesn't have any money. He knows nothing. So his worth is very low. So I, I would say that saying men are iron and women are gold is a very relevant analogy to the real world. Now, what happens at a time of war or in a time of crisis? Iron is more valuable than gold. And you, you, in a time of peace, what's happening right now is that people are saying iron and gold are the same. So they're making, they're trying to make swords out of the gold, and it's just not working because gold is not a good metal to make weapons out of. Mm-hmm. And eventually, when there is a crisis situation, people will find out real quickly that. Trying to make weapons out of all the gold was a terrible idea because they're gonna get slaughtered. And this this is this tends to happen in militaries all the time actually. So when there is a time of war, initially there are a lot of deaths and a lot of military generals are fired or killed. And that is because when there is a time of peace, it is not the most effective generals that rise the ranks, but the ones who are good at bureaucracy. And only In the time of conflict, do you find out whether someone is actually capable of doing that job or not? So we are at a time where we don't we're not actually testing things because we just don't have any incentive to. Yes, I I released a video yesterday called uh, negative visualization and the power of it, where this type of visualization is just embracing the worst case scenario where a lot of CEOs nowadays are actually encouraging negative thinking in their culture just because it helps them look around the corner. If a company is always super optimistic and it's like, no, no, nothing can go wrong, then you're not aware of the small things which can go wrong, which is just the nature of any complex system. Things will go wrong, so be aware of that. So a lot of... Yes. So a lot of CEOs are working with screenwriters, surprisingly, to get people thinking in a different way, because all a story is that the screenwriters are writing is creating a bunch of characters, doing some negative visualization of the worst case scenarios and actually making those worst case scenarios happen. That's all a story is. So it's a very strange little partnership that CEOs and screenwriters are having. That's one world. Now, in another world, let's say the people listening to this are from the technical space. Well, as engineers, there's a thing called stress testing a system where at times you encourage people to try to hack into the system to see if they can do it. Because if they can do it, what makes you think that a cyber security attack isn't uh, impending in the near future? So stress testing is extremely important, but 
it's not happening too much because things are getting too comfortable. People think that, oh, well, nope, there's no reason to stress test because everything has always been like this and everything will always be like this. Hmm. Do you do any kind of that stress testing for life math money to help you keep on evolving? Like, do you envision, huh, what if this goes wrong? What if this goes wrong? Which I think, before you even answer, just from observing some of your moves, it always seems like you're two steps ahead where a guy, a traditional guy with 200,000 followers on Twitter may rest on their laurels and be like, all right, well, this is it. But for you, I see you making micro moves where you got an Instagram channel up, a Facebook up, you're growing your email list. You have, you're expanding your presence on YouTube with doing these podcast episodes. So it seems like you're always looking around the corner. Am I making that assumption or is there some truth behind that? I haven't, well, used the term stress test before, but I've also been acutely aware of the fact that a large part of life math money is centered around Twitter and Twitter is a very censorship heavy platform, especially recently. And unconsciously or consciously, I have been trying to diversify. I'm putting different eggs in different baskets now with all these other social media handles, just in case of a Twitter ban. So it isn't a more conscious stress test effort so to say like you mentioned but it's more of a simple diversification thing because there have been a lot of people who get banned from twitter for no apparent reason outside of saying something that triggered somebody and there's no there's no telling when that might happen to you like you might say something that sounds completely reasonable and innocent to you but Twitter might still ban you for it. So it's a, it's essentially a game of chance. Mm -hmm. And would you say the email list has been the core of the life math money business nowadays? Or not really? Not I would really. Say it's the Twitter and the blog, but everything else has been growing. The thing with email lists is that email lists don't grow organically. In fact, they tend to shrink organically in the sense that if you have no outside source to get email lists, email subscriptions, it won't grow no matter how good your emails are. So if you have 20,000 email people on your email list and you're sending out really good emails, it will not suddenly become 21,000 because email is not a platform that people people are not going to forward your email to 30 other people to see so that they can also subscribe, but people will simply retweet your stuff or share your YouTube video. So e because email is not social, it is not a good primary source of growth. It is something that well, you can take users of other platforms for. Well, would you say email is more for growth or more for deepening pre-existing relationships? I would say it's for deepening pre-existing relationships and basically monetizing a little bit. Right, because that's what I predominantly use the emails for, where these YouTube videos, blogs, podcasts, uh, they're sort of like the flyers. Now, let's go back to that example. I, I know you got it from someone else, but I really liked that example where you treat the content sort of like the flyers and the website sort of like the actual restaurant. So now your content has some intent that you're trying to get them to your website. I just like to finish it off with the email list because this is the traffic that I own rather than, uh, you know, if someone stumbles on this YouTube video, great, but then they could just find another video and I may never see them again. While with an email list, it's something that for the Armani Talks brand, at least I've placed a lot of importance on that just because of the back end work. I see where you're coming from, though. It's important to decentralize. And where you were talking about Twitter, I don't know if you've been noticing, but I've been seeing a lot of people complaining about more restrictions on Instagram. I don't really use Instagram like that, but have you noticed something like that? 
I don't know that much about Instagram because essentially the way I use Instagram is that I use a software that screenshots my tweet and automatically posts it to IG. So I don't interact with the content or the people there at all. It's just impossible for me because I just don't have the time to actually sit and interact with so many different platforms. So I just use Twitter primarily and I have software which handles Instagram, Reddit, Facebook and everything else for me. But I will say that one of my accounts got a hate speech strike for saying that men are superior to women or something like that. I think it was like men are, women are inferior to men because men are stronger and more emotionally resilient. And that got a hate speech strike. So I think women, Instagram has a very wide definition of hate speech. And I did an article on this. Uh, I wrote an article on what is hate speech according to Instagram. And even saying that I am homophobic is hate speech. Essentially, almost anything is hate speech on Instagram and Facebook. It's a very restrictive platform. Yeah, and with a lot of different people's content, it could be taken in different ways. Where I've noticed that with Instagram, more fitness accounts are blown up there. Uh, I mean, I haven't even really thought about using Instagram too much with Armani Talks. Uh, so w- what do you do pretty much? You you get your tweets and expand it onto a different platform? I just mirror them. So this what the software will do is it'll take a screenshot of the tweet and it'll post the exact screenshot to Instagram and that's it. Gotcha. And is it attracting a different audience? I, I don't know for sure because I haven't really monitored it. Right. It's just something I set up once just for diversification, but I really don't have the time to actively manage all the other social media profiles. I have two businesses to run, plus I'm selling computer science, and I have to find time to lift, go out, and have a social life. So it's impossible for me to read and interact with people on all platforms. I just limit myself to Twitter, and I let software take care of the rest. It's a very un- a different way to do business where I had this public speaking coach two years ago and he found out that I, at that time, I believe I had 10,000 followers on Twitter and he was like, my goodness, uh, you have 10,000 followers. And it just was not computing for his uh, brain because he was on the older side where when he was initially starting his business, numbers like 10,000 for let's say just consulting was, you know, you could work your way up to it, uh, but a guy in his twenties having that kind of numbers was very different. And this public speaking coach was amazing. Uh, As we started to work more together, I started to notice just a, a very difference in philosophies where he saw YouTube, but he thought of it just as an entertainment tool. He never saw it as a tool in itself. So he would be like, yeah, yeah, I do YouTube every now and then, but I like to host in-person meetings, which is great. Don't get me wrong. But once the pandemic hit, the in-person meetings were now in the back burner. And now he was hitting me up and he's like, hey, man, uh, what is this YouTube thing you got going on again? Uh, You're saying that it brings in traffic after you're done recording the videos, where for us, Harsh, after we're done recording this video, it's going to keep on pulling in more and more people daily over time. Just little pools of people that discovered this video later on once we're done recording. So once this public speaking coach found out that he's basically detaching his time from the effort, it just was a completely different paradigm. So when you say stuff like, oh, well, I posted on one and I have software do the rest, there's a large segment of the population that's like, huh, you're telling me you don't have to individually go to Instagram, post, Facebook, post, <laughs> you know? So having technological understanding is extremely important for running a business nowadays. Yeah, people are really behind on internet money. I think that there are a lot of changes that are happening to the world right now. Primarily the fact that the internet is eating up everything that is offline. 
and crypto taking over the entire financial system as we know it. And many people still don't understand it. Many people think Bitcoin is a scam or some sort of investment vehicle, but they are wrong. And they're going to find that out very soon. Do you remember in 1994, people did not know what internet was. People would get PhDs by writing theses on why the internet is unscalable and will fail. And it, it was just a bunch of universities that had this network that was called the internet and it was growing. But everybody thought it was nothing and not a big deal. And it's just been 25 years and here we are where the internet is everything. Most people spend the majority of their day connected to the internet or somehow using the internet. The same thing is going to happen to crypto. The same thing is going to happen to other web technologies. People are just way behind. And the way technology works is that it becomes, it takes a much smaller time for things to become more and more mainstream. For example, how long did it take for TVs to enter every household? It took a while, but it took a much shorter time for mobile phones. It took an even shorter time for smartphones. So smartphones were introduced in around 2008, I think, by Apple. And how long has it been? It's been like 13 years. In 13 years, almost everyone has a smartphone. And we are at that point with crypto. It's going to be everywhere. People are just, people just think it's bullshit, but they are just behind the times. But pretty soon, in less than a decade, I would say, the world would be radically different. Yeah, and the world is consistently changing all the time. There's, I bought this book up in, I believe, our second podcast or our third podcast. I can't remember, but it's called My Big Toe by Thomas Campbell. And Toe stands for Theory of Everything, where he's a, a physicist, a NASA physicist, and he proposes a theory that merges Newtonian physics with quantum physics. Now, before I put you to sleep, <laughs> let me just uh, dumb it down a little. He basically talks about the essence of the world that we live in, and he's able to bring up and tie in concepts of not just math and physics, but of creativity, love, all of that stuff. And as I was reading the book, I came to notice that his theory of everything was drawing a lot of similarities with the internet where he's saying that we live in this big, big information system that's always growing and expanding more and more. And, and I was looking at it and I was like, huh, that's very similar to the internet where there's no deadline for, hey, this is exactly when the internet is going to stop growing. He said that the purpose of an information system is to keep on adding more and more content, keep on creating more connections, and keep on lowering the entropy. So with the internet, we're constantly creating more content. For example, this podcast. And then I can connect this podcast as part four to part three. Connections are being made. Meaning is being interpreted. And that's where you know I started to view the internet not only as this tool, but this mechanism to understand reality more. Um, if someone is extremely technical and they're very curious about how engineering, physics, spirituality, all that stuff connect, I recommend the book My Big Toe. It's a trilogy series and it appeals to uh, big minds and very technical people too. Do you see the internet as anything more than just a way to exchange information or how far do you think the internet is going to go? Mm, that's a difficult question because this is essentially asking to predict the future, but I would say that everything that we do physically will involve the internet in some or the other way. And there are some people who think that this is going to go all the way. That is, we will essentially become a part of some kind of matrix where we will all live happy lives in some matrix world in virtual reality. 
I think the likelihood of that happening is very low, but it is not zero. And but I think the more reasonable or the more likely answer is that everything would be tech enabled or somehow techy. To give you an example, if you take something benign like curtains, you would have some you will have programmable curtains where you can program them to be closed at night and open up with the sun so that you don't have to use an alarm clock and things of this sort. So you might have, hmm, let's say that you, hmm, hmm, hmm. let's say that there might be some system that monitors how much food you have in your kitchen. And when you run out of potatoes, the internet of things will automatically order potatoes for you and it will be delivered to your house so you don't have to go, go grocery shopping and it's automatically taken care of for you or maybe the ketchup bottle might have some sort of technology to detect that the ketchup is about to run out so a new bottle will be ordered and sent automatically to you so, in, so you mm -hmm. go ahead go ahead so in your everyday life in everything you do Technology will play some or the other sort of facilitating role and it would basically be enabled via the internet. So the internet is basically the platform which allows all of the technology to communicate with each other. To, to give you another example of this, your car might automatically be able to detect that it's running low on petrol. So when you're sleeping at 2 a.m., it might be able to drive the petrol pump and get filled automatically, the money will be taken out of your wallet or your bank account or your crypto account. And then the car will drive back and you don't have to, you know, consciously remember to fuel the car. One other thing can be something like, let's say that you, you need to, track your own fitness like whether you're losing weight gaining weight and there might be some kind of system which does it all for you it tells you what to eat when to eat and what you're doing wrong i think people are working on the sub of technology already so i think that the future is more likely to be tech enabled things that communicate with providers to make life easier for you of course, the downside is that you end up sharing a lot of data with these guys. Mm -hmm. So as you were speaking, you included the phrase Internet of Things. Uh, did you use that as a phrase or were you just kind of bringing it up as you were talking? Because I was actually going to bring up a thing called Internet of Things, oh, IoT. Yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with IoT. That's what I was referring to. Okay, cool, man. No, but I mean, this is something that, thing. yeah, yeah, this is what I did my research paper for on my master's and Ooh, when you brought it up yeah dude so i had to basically there were two research papers i had to do one was about internet of things and then the other one was about virtual reality and let's just talk about iot where you know you're connecting household items to the internet so i, I basically had to make the case oh well, this is a cool part of the future but then i also had to talk about the setbacks and you also bought up the setbacks as well, which is a lot of data is being shared where sometimes people can hack. So how scary would it be if you're getting attacked by your own toaster? <laughs> so, I don't think that is, like, I don't think people will get attacked by the items. I think what would happen is that these companies who are providing these services would figure out a way to manipulate you. For mm -hmm. example, if they realize that if you're, if you have bread, in the morning, you are more likely to eat more ketchup. And if ketchup is a very profitable product, they might start recommending that you eat bread for day and breakfast, dinner, lunch. And it might not be in your best interest. Yeah, and you're giving up a lot of your, the unpredictability that makes life. And that kind of transitions me into, you know, as we were talking about the internet, have you ever heard of the thing called the global brain? No, I have not. I have heard of the global computer, which is a theorem, but not the global brain. So this is something that, you know, anyone should just take some time to Google image 
and I'll drop a, a picture in the description box as well. And it's so cool because the global brain basically shows the connections of communication that's happening on the internet. And it looks just like the neural pathways of a brain. So it seems as though the earth is growing up in real time. Mm -hmm. And this is a phrase that, you know, was bought up a couple of years back. So it's a very unique time that we're living in when we're seeing the internet grow up. And it's like the earth is growing its neural pathways. That's how I view it. It's a communication channel. So I think the brain part is a good analogy. Although I don't think it's that centralized for us to be able to call it a brain. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, see, unless, see, if you take the Chinese internet, which is heavily censored and essentially controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, I think that would be a good analogy of a brain where the Chinese Communist Party <laughs> just makes a decision and all the other nodes have to follow it. But the true spirit of the internet is more of a... Well, have you seen an anthill? Yes. You know how ants communicate with each other via hormones and they're not free in the sense that if you, if, if an ant dies, it releases a particular hormone. And if you put that hormone on the ant, even it's alive, it'll go and take itself to the burial site. I never knew that. I think that the internet is far too decentralized for us to call it one brain. I think it's a more collection of entities that are on this communication network. I, 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 I think that, you know, despite what everyone thinks, I think that over time, the internet is still getting more and more decentralized, despite all these social media platforms getting more and more centralized, and despite Amazon being the biggest retailer. Because the barriers to entry are getting lower and lower. So 20 years ago, how expensive would it have been to host a blog or a website or some kind of e-commerce site? And now anyone can do it for less than 20, 30 bucks a month. So mm -hmm. the opportunity, the fact that you can do these things so much easily without requiring technical knowledge or a designer or some kind of programming person just makes the platform so much decentralized and easier to use. So I think that we have gotten farther away from a single brain in, over the past yeah. 20 years. Podcasts are the new radio. Blogs are the new newspaper. YouTube is the new TV. And... I wonder if there's an analogy for Twitter. These are just a few of the ways that new media is just giving more people opportunities. Well, Twitter would be the loudspeaker. <laughs> the the person that's passing out those flyers. You remember, have you been in one of those older markets where there's a guy who stands at, outside his shops and screams about what his shop is about? Like, we yeah. sell ice cream, we sell ice cream. <laughs> Yes, that, that's I did. Twitter. It was funny because a couple of years back, my brother had this little job that he was doing where he would hold a sign for a company. And this was in high school. So for a high school kid, any kind of money that you're making is good. But basically, he would just have the sign that was pointing to a shop. So that's what I just pictured. Uh, that's interesting. So it was like, Attracting attention to the shop. Yeah. And nowadays, if you uh, go down Tampa, you'll see those people doing cool tricks with their signs, they're like spinning it on one finger. They're putting it up and down and it's bringing a whole bunch of attention to the shop. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting. I'm not, I haven't seen that here, except McDonald's where they have this Ronald McDonald thing outside mm -hmm. the shop and it brings a lot of kids in. Yeah, see, one thing that I enjoyed from my childhood was physically going to a lot of these shops where even nowadays, every now and then, you know, I'll actually go to the library and work and it just feels good, you know, having some books around. Uh, there, I liked a lot of the physical shops that were there where nowadays a lot of the physical shops are restaurants and, you know, you'll have a Walmart and certain grocery shops. Do you think that too much technology is a bad thing where certain people get their groceries delivered to them. Do you think that's more luxury or do you think that it's becoming too much? 
I don't have a strict opinion on this. I get my groceries delivered and that is simply because it's cheaper. It doesn't take time and you get the same stuff. So for, I'm not talking about buying fruits and vegetables. I mean, you know, all the packed stuff you buy, all of that can come to your house from some, either you go and buy it from some retailer or it gets delivered to you. So I think the delivery is not only cheaper, but it's faster. You don't have to carry stuff to your house. Mm-hmm. So that's why I order my groceries. I don't have a strict... I haven't actually fully formed my thoughts on about it, technology being good or bad. And I will tell you why. If you take historically, like if you even if you read Socrates, there are paragraphs where he says that kids nowadays are not going out enough and they're sitting at home. <laughs> and that seems to be the complaint every single generation has Socrates had. Socrates said that? Yeah, I, I think it was Socrates. <laughs> I Socrates or Aristotle. So uh-huh. one of these guys had the same complaint. Let me, let me Google this just to be sure. I remember reading this a long time ago, so my memory is a little fuzzy. Another thing Socrates or Plato, I forgot which one it was, I didn't like, was the concept of writing. Yeah. Did listen, you ever hear about that? So this is a quote by Socrates, okay? The children now love luxury. They have bad manners contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants and other servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before nobility, chatter before company, sorry, uh, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs and tyrannize their teachers. So essentially, Sockets has the same things to say about children that people are saying now about children, which kind of tells me that this entire complaint is just a perception thing. Mm -hmm. Like if if this was the case 2000 years ago or whenever Socrates was alive, things should have deteriorated far more. But when we, when we say the same things, the kids are not going out for, we think that kids a hundred years ago were going out all the time and they were really happy and physically fit while, Kids nowadays are not. So every generation seems to have this opinion. So I don't think it's it's realistic. I think That's it's insane. more it, I think it's more of a perception thing. I will say this though that with the rise of information technology, that is, you know, internet, a lot of children have essentially lost touch with reality and they spend most of the time on their computer, which it's not good for their own personal development because it weakens their brain. So there are studies that have shown that if a kid spends a lot of time on his, on the smartphone before the age of five, it hinders their brain's development. So it's not good for them. And what do parents do? Parents are like, this kid is annoying me and you know he's making a lot of noise. I just give him the phone and he shuts up and stops bothering me. So they just give them a phone. So, But it's not good for the kid. <laughs> it's not good for their physical and mental health. Another, yeah, the, mm-hmm, go ahead. Well, no, the reason that Socrates uh, saying that that long ago is mind blowing to me because when I was growing up, I was swimming, I was playing basketball, I was playing these sort of games where, you know, back in, you know, I hate to be that guy, but back in my days, we didn't have uh, smartphones when I was five to six years old. You'd be lucky to get one of those Nokia phones where you'd play the snake game in it. See, Arman, but, I would, if I, I would say that if your grandfather was observing you, he would say the same thing. Like, in, back in my day, people would go out, and nowadays you guys are sitting at home and reading novels or whatever. So I think people have a selective memory of their own childhood. But they've forgotten the fact that they were also pretty similar. If you're not doing the same things, you were doing something very similar. So even if you were going out, it wasn't that you were running around all day it was probably that you were sitting around and playing some board game or card game or something that does not involve a lot of exercise you were just outside because you did not have a reason to be inside and that's it well for me no i was actually like pretty active but what i was setting it up for was you know i was playing hide and seek we were uh, what do you call it playing intense games of basketball swimming swimming for example but what i think that you know nowadays you know, I have a friend who's like, dude, my little brother can't play any sport. 
he literally just plays games on his iPad all day. Where I think in this generation, they'd be looking at me and be like, why in the blue hell would you be going outside in hot uh, summer weather and be running up and down playing basketball? So uh, I, I do agree with you where it's a game of perception where what I consider acceptable, they are probably like, huh? Why'd you do that? And vice versa. See, if that VR thing I mentioned becomes real and the kids of the future are playing VR games and sitting and, you know, on, with their headset on their heads, I bet all these kids who are playing video games today, their entire day, will say, back in my day, we used to go out and talk to our friends <laughs> and you guys are sitting here with this VR headset on you. So it's definitely a perception thing. Although I think that this has gotten exponentially worse with the rise of technology and it's definitely a bad thing now. And I had a friend who told me that she was trying to give her niece or someone a birthday gift, her nephew, I think. And she tried to give him money. And this kid is like, why don't you give me Xbox money? Like some, some, some Xbox cash or something so that I can buy upgrades for my character on Xbox. And isn't that insane? Yeah, that's that is insane. So, what's your because earlier on in today's talk, you were mentioning that you know younger Harsh used to get lost in video games for some time. Do you mm -hmm. still play video games, or is that something you just cut out completely? I think the last time I played video games was maybe when I was seventeen or eighteen. Mm -hmm. I did play video games once back in March for like a day or two. I had gotten really sick. I had gotten the stomach flu thing where I had gotten food poisoning basically and I was vomiting and basically it was not a good time to be, well, focused on anything productive and I just needed a way to distract myself and so I was playing some video games just to pass time quicker. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I don't think I've played in the past five, six years, seven years maybe. Yes. And see, for me personally, man, I don't have anything against video games if you play it once in a while. The only reason I don't play it at all is because I suck at it, man. For some reason, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I suck at all these different games. I could kind of play uh, Jack and Daxter from PS2, but anytime I'm playing these multiplayer games, I get whooped. And sometimes I'm thinking, man, there should be a barrier of how much they could beat you by. But that's my personal thing. Multiplayer <laughs> games are very interesting in the sense that you know, if someone's getting whooped, that means the game is not set up correctly to match players of the same skill level. Because, right. see, think of it like this. If you are, say, running a race and you are exceptionally good and the guy you're running with is exceptionally poor, then this won't be fun for you at all because you're going to win and that guy's going to lose and it won't be an accomplish for you. Uh, it won't be an accomplishment for you to win. So the ideal race would be between two people who are very similar. So they both mm -hmm. have an incentive to compete and, you know, victory would actually mean something. So I think yeah, that dude. if the game is setting up, basically setting you up to lose all the time, then the game is not well made. And this is something I learned from, uh, there's this video game called Zynga Poker. Are you familiar with this company? It used to be very popular on Facebook. Zynga or Zelda? Zynga, Z-Y-N-G-A. There was a game called Farmville and it also had a game on poker. Mm -hmm. no, I haven't heard of that. So on this poker game, what they would do to retain users is that if someone was losing, they would give them better cards the next game just so that they can win or they have a higher chance of winning. And they found that this helped retain a lot of people because if someone is losing too consistently, they're not going to return to your game. They're going to say, this game sucks. I'm not having any fun. Mm -hmm. So they would intentionally rig the game in the favor of people who are weaker just so that they stick around and the game is fun for them. So they were getting like handicap points. Man, if that was the case, I may still be playing video games. <laughs> See, he, let me just tell you my breaking point. So this happened a couple of years back, like a, over five years ago. I was playing this one basketball game with my roommate at the time. And in the beginning stages, I was up. I had 
14 points. He had six points. So, you know, I'm feeling a little confident. I'm like, yo, he's actually pretty good. And I think I'm going to win. Then as some time goes on by, he's up at 25 points. And I still have the same amount of points. Then as more time goes on by, he's beating me by 30 points, 40 points, 60 points. And I am getting so angry. Wait, how long does a basketball game last? Like one hoop is one point, right? Unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. So, well, no, one hoop is two points. And if you hit it behind a certain length, it counts as three points. If you hit a free throw, it's one point. So basically just a dumb... Free throw is like if someone hits you very hard, then you get uh, to shoot without anyone guarding you. Oh, like a penalty. Like a penalty, yeah. So to break it down, there's you could either score one point, two points, or three points. Okay. So this dude is whooping me, man, over like 60 points. And here's the thing. I'm getting enraged. But the only problem is <laughs> I, I don't know who to get angry at. So at first, I'm to my roommate like, yo, man. Why the hell are you so good? Uh, you, you, something. You're, are you cheating? Are you doing some sort of codes? He's like, no, no, I, I'm not doing any codes. And then I'm like, wait, yeah, I shouldn't be getting angry at him. But I still had anger. And I'm like, uh, who made this game? Uh, who are the software developers? Uh, let me talk to these people real quick. So now I'm over here trying to get mad at the software developers. And then I'm like, wait a minute. No, no, they were just following orders. Who thought of this game? And eventually I'm like, and who discovered electricity to even make this happen? And it was just, I was getting enraged, bro. And after that, I'm like, man, forget it. I'm never touching video games again. And that was my last time playing. Man, have you played a game called GTA Y City? Yeah, uh, Grand Theft Auto? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a mission in the game where you have to take a remote controlled helicopter and you have to use it to blow up a building. You have to plant bombs inside the building and that remote control helicopter. It's a very difficult mission. And as a kid, I could never get past that mission. So I started to like dislike the game because I just could not complete it. So I think that for a video game to be fun, it has to be challenging enough for you to try hard and succeed. But it shouldn't get to the point where it's so challenging that it's becoming frustrating for you. So I think that sweet spot has to be found. And I think in the future, the way video games will do it is that they will learn how good you are as you play along and then Mm. adjust difficulty accordingly. So if you're very good, they will make the game harder so it's still fun for you. Is that something they do nowadays or you're saying for the future? I don't really know whether they're doing this nowadays, but I think in the future, this will probably be a thing. I I would say that in multiplayer, they might already be doing it nowadays because, so I recently, the game I was playing, I told you was a game called Dota 2, Mm D-O-T-A 2. And I don't think I've played this game in like six, seven years, but now it has something called ranking. So I think it's something like, if you play well, your ranking is probably going up. And if you're playing badly, your ranking is going down. And it's probably matching you with players of similar ranking. Okay. See, that would make a lot more sense. Or at least have a certain filtration system. Because I know you don't watch basketball, but someone losing by 60 points is really bad. Where it's almost unfathomable sometimes. And it's just not even realistic at that point. Ever been able to understand why someone would play a game like football football or basketball on a computer? This is something that you would want to play in real life. And I think for video games, people would want to play something like Prince of Persia, where you can do stuff you can't do in real life. (laughs) It's interesting you bring that up. So my brother would normally play the RPG games like Final Fantasy Kingdom Hearts, Prince of Persia as well. And I would predominantly play the sports games, mainly because I did play sports outside of video games. So it just kind of felt like I was unleashing more capabilities. So for a while, I couldn't dunk a basketball. So when I would play the video games, I'm actually dunking the basketball. And part of me was like, yeah, I did that. Uh, And for me personally, I never got RPG games because I was like, 
man, you know, that's not even possible. At least I'm getting closer to dunking. You're never going to just grab wings and fly. But it's unique to see how you have the complete opposite perspective. Hmm. I think what you say also makes a lot of sense. I, I totally get what you mean here. I would say the more nerdier you are, the more likelier you are to play fantasy games. Like I would play a lot of fantasy games as a kid. But I would never in my life play a cricket game or a football game or a <laughs> basketball game. It just would not happen. I would not even find it fun. I don't think I even liked racing games that much. I just I was more into games like Oblivion, Elder Scrolls, and what were the other games I used to play? Wait, Bioshock. I used to play Bioshock. That was that was a pretty good game that really impacted how I thought, uh, especially about capitalism and. The philosophy of Andrew Ryan is very interesting. And I still need to read the books by Ayn Rand, but it's it sparked some interest there. What's his name? And Ryan? Andrew Ryan. So there's a character in that game who builds a city in an ocean because he finds that there are too many constraints of being free in the surface world. So the open dialogue... Is something like uh, I, I don't really remember. It's been so many years, but it's something like, "Who is entitled to the sweat of a man's brow?" And the capitalists say it's wait. The socialists say that it's the state, and the communists say it's everybody, and the religion people say it's God. But I say it's the man himself. So I built the city of rapture in the middle of the ocean where the scientists would not be constrained by morality and the artists would not be constrained by rules and the big will not be constrained by the thoughts of the small and similar to that. So essentially, it's a it's a very interesting philosophy that I've found to be very relevant to today. I'm just quoting this from memory. It's been about a decade, so forgive me if I made some mistakes there. In the and this, is from a, this is from a video game? Yeah, it's from a video game called Bioshock. You know, then, then I played. You, oh, go ahead. I, I played the GTA games that I really loved. Vice City San Andreas. Looking back, I think it's all just wasted time, but I had fun when I was playing them. So, for a while in the US, uh, there was this petition to get rid of GTA because they're saying that it was sparking violence and kids. What were your thoughts about that? I don't think it's much of a role. And I will tell you why. See, first of all, when people say that video games give kids the values that violence is okay and normal, it makes sense in theory. Like, had I not had been observing people who play video games, I would have probably said, yeah, probably does have some effect that these kids are spending hours being a character who is killing people left and right. So it definitely would have some sort of impact. But in practice, it does not seem to be the case because millions of people play games like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto and God knows what else. And just about none of them are extremely violent. So it does not, the theory is not holding up in real life, so I don't think it has any real impact. I think it's just one of those theoretical things that don't apply in real life. The theory could also be extended where there's other groups that will say violent movies do this, where Quentin Tarantino for a while, uh, and if you're not familiar with him, mm. a lot of his movies has a lot of violence, was getting criticized for sparking that sort of stuff in kids. Uh, Vince McMahon from World Wrestling Entertainment pretty much had to call it entertainment instead of federation because he wanted to remind people that a lot of this stuff uh, was scripted and, you know, he was getting criticism for sparking violence. And, you know, even musicians get that label as well. So it's very hard to pin down where the line is. I don't think the line exists. I don't really think it matters because... It just does not seem to have an effect. Like, can you give me 
practical examples of people who became extremely violent because of video games like you would think that with all these millions of people watching movies and playing video games at least say 10% of them or 5% of them were becoming insane but it does not seem to be the case at all like it just doesn't so the experiment shows that the theory is false i think that a lot of people especially the ones who complain about things like these they just have too much time and they want to feel important so they just go and start protesting things but it's a very simple observation to make like i would say over a billion people in the world play video games so even if 5% of them were becoming violent because of video games you should have 50 million high end criminals who are taking up guns and killing everybody but are they actually doing that no so the theory is wrong exactly and yeah i mean that's the thing with a lot of these research papers where my thing is where do you get the data and you know you mentioned that there is no line and you know the thing is when certain things scale there's certain guidelines that are filled or i don't know about where you're from but in the us for example if a song has curse words in it it either gets bleeped out or completely replaced due to fcc guidelines so mm-hmm. it becomes difficult for content creators to see okay what can i do how much artistic expression can i embody and what can what is off limits and one of the fields that's getting the most heat for this nowadays especially in today's climate where everyone's trying to get offended by something very quickly are comedians where when i was a little kid uh, have you ever heard of eddie murphy probably not i mean I comedian so he's a very big comedian and in the 80s and 90s he was probably one of the top tier comedians out there but man this guy would curse and when i was a little kid every now and then they'd be playing his old school specials and some of the stuff that he would say i'm like man i wonder if he could even say that stuff today without getting canceled so what's your thoughts on cancel culture in relationship to creativity i think cancel culture people are just a bunch of kids and just in kid shit but unlike a responsible society which would you know have control over its children we are, have become a place where these kids are becoming too empowered and they think they can do whatever they want just because their feelings are hurt so it's not a good thing to have that and i don't i don't respect cancel culture really i think that a good promoter can use it for essentially promotion but it also tells me that a lot of things will move online because it's much harder to cancel something that is online than to cancel something that is offline because how do things get canceled offline a bunch of people show up and they start threatening violence the when you start seeing that okay this is not it's not safe to host this thing we we don't have enough security so let's cancel this that's how offline things get canceled online it's much harder like you can still get banned from social media and things like that but if you have a presence elsewhere it's it's very difficult to cancel you mhm there's the guy from hardcore history it's a pretty famous podcast i forgot his exact name i think it's dan something uh, he had this ted talk a couple of years back i believe in 2015 where he was talking about the rise of new media and he says that in this generation if you're strategic enough you pretty much get canceled when you personally quit so if you if you say okay i don't want to create content anymore for example that's pretty much over for you or if something or if certain platforms are coordinating hey getting rid of you you could always have a backup plan with the email list and i don't really know uh, much about telegram I-, i know you use that would you say that's pretty free f- flow like you could say whatever you want without having to worry and look Instagram over your shoulder a lot has a lot of leeway like you can say whatever you want for the most part it is one of the freest speech platforms that exist and that's why oh. silicon valley doesn't like it and w- tried to get it banned from the play store a telegram 
yeah, Telegram. Yeah, I gotta learn more about it. Now, the, uh, some people have messaged me and it's like, "Yo, man, you should start a Telegram group." So sure. after this talk, I'm gonna see how this works. I think I signed up for your one. Telegram is a very useful tool. You can it's like a it's like having a personal Twitter where you can say whatever you want without getting censored or without having to worry about getting banned. I will say that over the long run, we will have more decentralized platforms like Twitter. So this whole phenomenon of these social media companies coordinating and banning people will eventually go away. You think so? You think they're going to have less power in the future rather than more? Over the long term, yes. Over the short term, I think they will have more power because they are coordinating and even the government seems to be participating. I remember reading that now the US government is flagging who should be censored and who should be removed from different social media platforms in the name of COVID. So they identify individuals who are spreading quote-unquote misinformation about COVID and then telling these platforms to ban them or shadow ban them or restrict them in some or the other way. So I think that, you know, you end up at actual fascism when you have businesses, governments, and the media colluding together. So we are at that point already. It would be interesting to see how things go from here. Yeah, because there's no blueprint, basically. When there's so many different people that now have a voice, it's very hard to understand what to do next, especially when you're a, a person of power. So, uh, you know, they often talk about history repeats itself. And some people say that it doesn't repeat itself. It, it rhymes. So it happens in a different context. So are you aware of it ever happening before where, you know, government media colluded? I did hear that it's happened in the past before. Oh, yeah. I'm not... The rise of Nazi Germany was a bunch of people colluding. What would happen is that a lot of rich people from America and other places would fund Hitler because it would essentially act as a buffer for from Soviet communism. So Germany was in the middle of Russia and Europe. And rich people were worried that if communism spreads westwards, they would lose everything or they might be put to death. So they would fund Hitler. Yeah. And Hitler, obviously, he had control of the media. And so it was like a collusion between government and media and big businesses. And that enabled fascism to survive. And we are at that point now. I don't really want to comment about the whole vaccination thing, but it seems to have very similar undertones to me. Regarding what happened in the past with media and government working a little too much with one another? Yes. Yeah, and we don't have to talk more about that, but it is interesting that you bring that up where I think whoever controls the media or has access to the media has a lot more power in the information age where, you know, some people don't even question what they hear. I know a lot of like just pockets of people that if they see it on the Internet, immediately they're like, I believe it. I mean, it's on the Internet. But, you know, earlier on in our conversation, we we're talking about how easy it is nowadays to set up content. So it really comes down to spotting, yo, how reliable is the source? And more importantly, what's the intent behind these sources? Hmm. You know, this is changing very fast though. Like 20 years ago, people would blindly trust what they would see on TV. And nowadays that is not the case. We have had so much publicity given to fake news that most people have some sort of understanding that the news is not 100% accurate. I was recently talking to this girl who, who's a friend's sister and she might be in 10th grade. So she's like 
maybe 15 or 16 years old. And somehow the topic of news came up and her first reaction was, it's all fake. And this is 16 year old and her thinking about the news is that it's all fake, which goes to show how much credibility news people have lost. When these children will grow up to be adults, they will not care about the news or watch it because they think it's all fake, which is true. It is a lot of it is fake. So the credibility these news organizations have is essentially going to die with the generation that came before us. Who trusts the news now? People who are 40 and above. Basically, who grew up thinking the news is legitimate. People who grew up thinking the news is bullshit are not going to watch the news. So the news is done. Like It's on the decline and it's going to end soon. Even today, most news websites are essentially run like glorified blogs and only manage to survive because social media companies send extra traffic to them or they, they tend to place them higher in ranking because they think it's more credible. But they're essentially just blogs. Like they, they are no, There's no special content there and the content is not even that good or accurate. So over the long run, these guys are screwed. Like they're done. When I was growing up, man, whatever, for example, CNN, Fox, MSNBC said was law. Like there was literally no other portals of getting information where this is a rather new phenomenon where it's funny that you brought up the 15 year old because this is a pretty crucial age for her where she's still creating her perception of the world. And let's say when she's in her like 40s, for example. I wonder how people are going to be learning. Is it mainly going to be through self-education and doing their own research? Are there going to be any central figures that people listen to? Uh, It's it's really interesting to ponder on. It's like a thought experiment. I think what will happen is that institutions will end up getting replaced by individuals. For example, instead of you going to MIT to learn, what will happen is that all the best professors at MIT will release their courses online for sale. And instead of you buying a course by going to university, you can just buy it online and watch it in your free time. There can be some sort of forum that can act like a classroom to have discussion, but you will not have to go through a university. So the middleman would be cut out. And that's kind of happening today as well. There are a lot of great professors who have basically released their books out and their courses out online for people to watch and learn from on websites mm-hmm. like Udacity. So yeah, I... I think that in the future, there will be influential people, but not influential institutions. You would not watch CNBC. You would probably follow some guy who gives out his opinions because you trust him or something. Yeah, it's more like a buffet, for example, where you start to pick. And let me just give you an example where it's even ranging beyond the media. Uh, For one of these jobs that I worked, uh, there were a lot of electrical engineers with years and years of training. But one of the guys that knew how to fix things the best never got his degree. He was actually a high school dropout. And he ended up getting a certification for for fixing certain circuits. But within the company, he was actually one of the most valuable people because he could literally fix everything. But he just got a certification rather than a degree. So where you're saying courses, individuals are going to become very popular, I think you know in the future, certifications are going to be very popular as well because you're getting very targeted knowledge. Where nowadays, you know, if someone gets a certification over a degree, uh, there's a poor reputation regarding it, where I don't think that should be the case because certs have so much practical knowledge behind it. With your program that you're doing with computer science, are you getting like some sort of certification once you're complete? Somewhat. So it isn't exactly once you complete. So it's a collection of about 60 courses that are completely independent. And at the end of every course, you can pay and get a certificate that you have completed this course. So I would get like 50, 60 certifications. Okay. 
Okay, see, that makes sense. Because uh, let me just give you another example real quick. A couple of years back, I would say 15 to 20 years ago, if someone said, yo, I'm an independent author, a lot of people immediately perceived that as, oh, so you never got published. So technically you're a failed author. But nowadays with the rise of KDP, have you heard of that? Like Kindle Direct Kindle Publishing? Publishing yes. Yeah. Nowadays, say some of the most creative people, they're like, Man, why the heck do I need a publishing team uh, to you know, slow the process down? Now, sure, the publishing team has a bunch more marketing dollars. They could promote your work. They could do a lot of the machine-like activities. When you have a publishing team, you kind of have this machine working for you. Nowadays, a lot of people are like, man, who cares? I got my own following. I'll send my products directly to them uh, and I'll keep a larger margin. Even products like Gumroad, where you keep a way bigger margin, these were not even concepts that people valued back in the days. But nowadays, it's like, you know, I'm an independent author and I'm pretty proud of proud of that, to say the least. Agreed. I think the middleman, this is another instance of the middleman being cut out. So what would happen earlier is that you would go to some big publisher and he would take 70% of the sale, you would get 30% as royalty. And yeah. now you can just publish the book yourself. So if you take, for example, Gumroad, now people used to think that, you know, like you said, that being an independent author means that you're not successful. But my books have sold tens of thousands of copies. So I'm essentially, I've, I've essentially, you, one could say I've written bestsellers. So I would say I'm a successful author. And instead of getting 30% as royalties, I get 96.5% because I only pay Gumroad 3.5%. So I get most of the money. So this is better for me and it's better for the final consumer because he can get the product at a more reasonable price. And you could also have affiliates as well where exactly. other people sell your products for you. Yeah, so it's, it's make, it makes more sense for everybody except the middleman. And the middleman was just a rent seeker. He wasn't adding that much value. Yeah, I mean, I know this guy who's a published author and for six years, he's been working on his book and his editor or whatever is like, oh, you got to take this off. You got to add this section. You got to twist this section. Otherwise, art readers won't like it. Where I'm not bashing all uh, published authors from a different company. But what I'm saying is that as an independent author, you get so much more creativity and flexibility. And just to give you an example, so for the Armani Talks brand, I predominantly focus on short stories where nowadays you don't see too many different content regarding the, the, the short stories. So what I've been doing recently is I've been working on this series called 101 Short Stories, Essays, and Insights to Improve Communication Skills. And one of the releases thus far is Wordplay, which is currently out on Amazon. And it's going to be a series that I'm releasing over time. Now, for me to even run an idea like this to a publishing company, they'll be like, huh, what? No, no, no one reads short stories like that. But people who follow the Armani Talks brand do. So I'm not over here trying to sell to everyone. I'm trying to sell to my audience. And here's the beauty. A lot of people on Amazon are somehow discovering the book and they're like, oh, whoa, like my day is so busy. I don't have time to read a book from beginning to end. So the short stories are way more convenient for my lifestyle. But this idea couldn't have even been executed if I had that big middleman who's like, no, 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 you got to wait, you got to slow things down and all that other stuff. So I find value in being independent. And what you were saying with Gumroad, I mean, 10,000 sales is nothing to scoff at. And these are products that you own and not other people. Yep, I think that the fewer masters you have, the more freedoms you will have. So if you take, if you have a publisher that you have to listen to, then not only do you have to censor yourself to fit the publisher, you, you might also be forced to watch what you say to protect the reputation. It does happen if you are a brand ambassador or something like that. So there are a lot of restrictions that come with things like these. Whereas if you're independent, you can do and say whatever you want. Like 
you will not you cannot go to any branded podcast and find a discussion that says that you should only marry women that have a good relationship with their father because they just lack the freedom to be able to say it on the other hand people like us we can say whatever we want whatever we think is true regardless of how controversial it is because what are you going to do like fire me from a job that i don't have it's not going to yeah. happen and to take it even a level further like with the unapologetic truth series thus far we're not really doing this for any end game where you know if a lot of people fun. watch it yeah it's fun if a lot of people watch it they watch it but ultimately we're able to talk about whatever we want to talk about without someone being like hey make sure you go through points this this and this and when we don't have that person we're capable of talking about so many different concepts that we've already discussed in today's episode and all the other episodes beforehand where you don't necessarily see that in mainstream entertainment you see that in hyper targeted niches like the one we're creating right now definitely agree although i would say that we have somewhat been inspired by joe rogan's podcast where it's completely free flow and even joe rogan was able to build his podcast by being free you listen to joe rogan i used i don't listen to joe rogan in the sense but i have watched a couple of episodes and this whole thing where a podcast would basically be a conversation is something that i think is was popularized by joe rogan now that you bring it up i, I could definitely see that I personally haven't listened to Joe Rogan too much growing up or what am I saying growing up he's he's rather new but my yes. roommate yeah my old school roommate used to always talk about Joe Rogan my initial encounter with Joe Rogan was actually not regarding podcasting at all uh, have you ever heard of Carlos Mencia no i have not so there was this period where he was on top of the world in terms of comedy but there were some accusations being made that he stole jokes from other people and one of the guys that was leading the charge on taking him down was Joe Rogan which at that point was considered career suicide because Carlos Mencia was this huge comedian and people knew Joe Rogan as the fear factor guy which is something he did before What his guy? podcast the fear factor guy so this was a show that he was the host of okay. uh, and this is a show where people do a lot of outrageous activities to you know, show courage i never watched it in detail but that was a show he was a host of oh i remember i think i've seen some advertisement of the show and they they make people jump off of buildings and surround them with cockroaches i remember seeing an advertisement yeah so he was the host of that going up against this show. yeah I, i never finished the whole thing um, but him going up against carlos mencia was huge and for a while he was blackballed from a lot of different comedy clubs but what he did was in my opinion i think that was the first viral video i saw where he actually took clips of carlos mencia making uh, certain jokes that resembled other uh, comedians and it sounded almost identical and this is when youtube was just becoming a thing and this ended up going huge and a lot of people say that because of that video carlos mencia's career ended and that's how i personally knew joe rogan so a couple of years later uh, like my roommate at the time was like yo have you ever heard of this thing called the joe rogan experience it's an amazing podcast i'm like wait a minute is that the same guy who had that debacle with carlos mencia so i say all that to say that you never know where people are going to be in the future and um Yeah, I guess I I guess Joe Rogan now that you bring it up did inspire a lot of different podcasters. I don't think we ever discussed the whole Joe Rogan thing before, so it wasn't like an explicit thing. But I remember having Joe Rogan in mind when you asked me to do a conversational podcast. So I thought that yeah, I like Joe Rogan, that would be interesting. Right, because I think that when you're interviewing someone a little too much, uh, that's cool and all, but it doesn't sound as authentic as when me and you are just basically talking like two friends. Totally agree. 
what do you think of the whole interview style podcast thing? I think that the guest, well, the host of the podcast ends up sucking too much to the guest. That is, they, they give them too much credibility. I think that there are not enough difficult questions are asked. Right. I, I do think at certain times it's needed. I think it's good to have a portfolio in regards for media content where conversations do have a good place. But every now and then, uh, I, I think that just asking someone questions is a good thing for inquiry. Let's say you're releasing a new product and I'm just asking you questions regarding what the consumers can benefit. That's a good situation for an interview style rather than me contributing like nonstop as you're trying to speak. So I really think it depends on the context. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, for example, I'm going to be having a little interview with my book on wordplay where the person is just going to ask me what's expected in the book. He's already read it, so he knows how to ask me some detailed questions. And I think that's going to be um, a great tool, especially if you're an independent creator. It, it kind of ties into the concepts we were bringing up earlier. Hmm. That's very interesting. So what's your book about? Like, what do you mean by wordplay? So wordplay, I called it that because in order to truly understand communication skills, you have to have a different paradigm than how we learn math. Whenever we're learning math, we're learning it with very strict rules. You can't necessarily use a multiplication sign as a subtraction sign. But in order to really learn words, you have to have an element of play to you. You should be able to tell jokes. You should be able to write like you talk. And throughout this uh, book, I have 101 short stories uh, speaking about communication skills from different angles. A few of the topics I include are public speaking, social skills, uh, emotional resilience, creativity, uh, storytelling, etc. But rather than just giving it in a lecture form, like, hey, do this, 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 I present it in short stories form. So this allows the other person to learn, but have no clue that they're learning, which, in my opinion, is the best way to learn communication skills. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole essence of the book. Um, and it's a different way of learning, especially as the world is becoming busier and not everyone has time to just finish a book from beginning to end. That's so, very interesting. I, th I think that that concept hasn't fully been explored. Are you familiar with the Panchatantra? The what, Harsh? The Panchatantra. No, I haven't. So, Is it a book? Uh, it's a collection of short stories that have a moral and it's intended for children. That is, you know, there are animal stories where an animal does X, Y, Z thing and there's a moral at the end. So mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is some something that's very similar where you're teaching by telling people a story. And exactly. I think that humans resonate with that because who wants to read a treatise or like an essay? Mm -hmm. People, you don't want to do that. And it's very difficult to apply an essay. You, If you have examples, that's much easier to apply. So is there any particular story that you would like to share that you found the most interesting or the most useful for people? Yes. So one of them is a very small story regarding bouncing back from hard times. And w one thing that wordplay is different on is that it takes very unique circumstances or very ordinary circumstances and turns it into a lesson based off of my experiences. So one of them, I bring up a concept regarding the tuna man. And this is basically when I worked in Subway for a certain period of time. And do you have Subway in where you're from? Oh, yeah. I, I, I like Subway. Yeah. So this was my first ever job. I was roughly 15 or 16 at the time. And around that time, there was this one guy that would routinely keep coming to the shop and ordering the same thing. He would always get white bread, tuna, lettuce, tomatoes, salt, and pepper. The thing with this guy was that he was extremely rude. He would always yell at you, tell you to work faster, and he wouldn't give you any tips. A very rude guy. 
So at that time, I was a very young kid, and I wanted this guy to like me a lot for some reason because I wanted to get tips, and my manager would always work alongside me. He wanted to see if I could convert this guy into being a fan of me. So after seeing that he would order the same food multiple amounts of times, I decided to memorize his order. And the next day that he came, I ended up saying his order to him before he could say the order. I was like, no, no, don't even mention it. You want the white bread, tuna, uh, provolone cheese, blah, blah, blah. And at that time, I thought he was going to be like, yo, uh, thank you so much for uh, noticing. Uh, wow. You know, in an idealistic mind, that was what was going to happen. But instead, what happened was that he became furious. He's like, man, why the heck are you observing me like that? Why are you always observing me so much? Let me talk to your manager. And he was getting heated. And ultimately, I was extremely offended. It really hurt me, my 15, 16-year-old self. Until the next day, I saw him yelling at two of my coworkers, at two Russian coworkers. And the moral of the lesson regarding the story was that certain times you could be behaving a certain way, but you are going to encounter rude people. And if you're always letting it get under your skin, then that's going to be a big problem. The reason that we personalize is because we think that act is strictly happening to us. But the next day, when I saw my two coworkers getting the same sort of treatment, suddenly, personal, suddenly personalization stopped. So the moral of the lesson required... Hold on, Harsh. My bad. There's This thing is lagging for some reason. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, it was like saying uh, connecting. So the moral of the story was that avoid personalizing because it's rarely that serious. And this is just one of the stories from Wordplay that helps you think in a completely different way. It turns ordinary experiences into potential lessons that you could always look out for. Hmm, that that's a very interesting story, and I have a different lesson from it. And my take from similar experiences is that sometimes you are not the problem; the problem is them, and there is nothing that you are doing wrong. In the mm-hmm. sense that you know we tend to blame things on ourselves when social interactions go wrong, but sometimes, and not always, but sometimes it's not our fault and you can do everything right and the other person can just be an asshole or might just be might just have a flawed personality and might make it bad but that is their problem and it is not you i'll give you an example of how i observed it okay so when i was younger i would have some female friends who were who basically did not have any personality they would not be excited about anything or they would not want to talk much with anyone. They would just sit around and do nothing. And I have a very extroverted personality. So I would try to get things done. I, I would try to talk to them. And when I was 16, 17, you know, you try to talk to someone and they don't talk at back at you. And you would think that there is something that you are doing wrong and there's something off about you. But as I grew older, I have had a lot more interactions with a, a lot more different women. and. I just realized that the problem was never me. It, it, in this case, it was not me. It was just them and their terrible personality that they couldn't even handle or they couldn't even carry a conversation with someone who was enthusiastic about talking to them. So it was their problem, not mine. I wasn't doing anything wrong. And another enthusiastic person or someone with a better personality gets along really well and they are able to respond well. So it was not me, it was them. And in your case too, that it was not you doing something bad with this sandwich tuna guy. It was that guy's issue. And you were simply feeling that his problem was because of you when essentially it was just his problem and there is nothing that you can do about it. Absolutely. And I really liked how you talked about your interpretation because in the beginning of the book, I say that a lot of these stories are meant to be mirrors where you see someone else's experience and it could be interpreted in different ways. So rarely do I try to say, hey guys, this is the moral of the story. 
because good storytellers try to avoid doing something like that, where it's open to interpretation. That's what separates art from lecture. So when you just described your situation, it's something that was sparked due to the Tuna Man short story. So that was the ultimate intention regarding wordplay, and it's going to be a series where, after wordplay, there's another book coming out called Street Smarts,、uh, Limit Breaker, and Tough Love. It's four different books under the series, and it's just for people who enjoy short stories in order to learn. So, I'll keep you posted in regards to how it goes, and it should be fun. Do you think currently?、Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. I'm saying that I would love to read your book. Please send me a copy when you have it. One hundred percent. I'll actually send it over to you after our call. Awesome. Oh, it's released already. Wait, so, let me check your Gumroad. Hold up. No, it's not on Gumroad. It's on Amazon. Harsh. Wait, Amazon. What name do you use on Amazon? Armani Docs. Yes. Wordplay one one short stories. Man, four hundred sixty-four pages. That's a big book. Yes, so it's one hundred one short stories. So each one、um, is like four hundred pages. Yeah. Here's the thing: most of them are one thousand words or less. So when you're committing to a story, you're not over here having to read and spend your entire day on it. You could actually read it in a quick little sitting, and the talks are not connected with one another. So you could read one story. And it's completely disconnected from another story. Nice. I just bought your book. Awesome, Harsh. I appreciate it. See, guys, this is what friends do. We support each other's businesses. Now, with that being said, Harsh, I recall a while back you mentioning you were thinking about releasing a paperback. What's your updates on your thoughts regarding that? I just haven't had the time. I think I'll do it next year. And these are basically going to be a collection of your best items, right? Where my it's best centralized. Best articles. Yes. So the way I'm doing it right now, I'm still making some progress on it. I've hired a proofreader, and what she's doing is that she's reading all of my articles from the beginning, and correcting typos. So it would be much easier to release a paperback. Gotcha. I think it's going to be a good opportunity, Harsh, just because. It's going. It's a different experience when someone is also holding your book. It, it's just different, or you know, even in a Kindle where everything is connected into one. I definitely agree. I think paperbacks. I love reading paperbacks. I rarely read Kindle books, simply because I like the feeling of the book physically moving, like the bookmark traveling through the book. Yes. You get that sense of accomplishment. Yes, and then you get to keep the book in a library as a trophy of accomplishment. So I, I like that feeling. I think I think I'm a little old fashioned in that sense. Oh no, man! I'm the exact same way. Where I came to realize recently that a lot of people listen to their books. So I turned level up mentality into an audio book recently, but that wasn't even a concept for me. Where people listen to books. Oh no! Do you do audio books? I listen to a lot of audio books, mostly when I'm doing cardio or walking. Uh huh. So I I have a subscription to Audible, and they give you like credit every month. So I end up listening to a ton of audio books. I love audio books. They're very convenient. You know,、mm -hmm. you use it for books that you're not gonna read seriously or something that. You know, you you know, if you have if you're serious about reading, you will have big ass list of books that you want to read, and you know for a fact that it's, it's impossible for you to read all of them simply because there's so many. So, audio books are good for books that are you're not very serious about. So it's you don't want to read very seriously or in depth, and the book has some kind of story in it. So it it's very difficult to listen to an audio book that is. Like a bunch of essays, although it's not it's not that difficult. I think if the book is interesting, it's it's easy. Like the Illimitable Man audio book is very easy to listen to,、mm -hmm. but the audio book by if you take this one that I had to drop the Millionaire Fast Lane that was a difficult audio book to listen to. So you would want like some kind of biography or autobiography or something that has a story. 
like there's this book called chaos monkeys by it's it's a book about silicon valley and some guy's adventure wait let me see wait yeah so the book is by a guy called antonio garcia and the book is his story of how he got into silicon valley and the startup he built and how he got into facebook twitter and things like that so that was a very interesting book to read because it was a story so you did not have to focus so much like you were not trying to absorb all the material you were just listening to a story it's 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 useful in that sense and you took this one in through audiobooks yes so harsh today's talk was good and you know we discussed a lot of different topics now that i think about it i'm going to be putting all the time stamps in the description box so people can just go around and we could always review one of these episodes later on i uh, thank you again for joining today's episode any last words no arman this was a very good episode and i'm glad to be here on part 4 and i'm looking forward to part 5 for sure man i'm looking forward to it too we always have a lot of good topics to talk about and it's hard to find topics like this being discussed too often agreed i think that this is one of the most unique podcasts that i i'm a guest on yeah i i normally get emails from people and they're like man you two have such good chemistry <laughs> which is a compliment all right harsh uh, thank you again for joining the podcast i'm going to be putting all the links that we discussed about in the description box right on below and thank you everyone for tuning in till next time